Hi, everyone. Welcome to Off the Podium. I have Martin Kuskman with me, and he is in Colorado. I'm not sure what city. Welcome to Off the Podium. Very nice to meet you. I'm in Denver. Okay. So um, what are you doing now? We talked a little bit off, off record, but what are you doing now? How are you preparing for all the things? You're an um, you know, active performer. You're an active educator. How has everything going on in the world today really impacted and affected you, um, positive and negative maybe? Um, well, believe it or not, there, there are positives, uh, lots of negatives, yeah. but, um, but look, if we, um, I'm an, I'm an optimistic person, just, just the way I am, it can't fix me. And I look for positives in every, every challenge in every, in every possible situation thrown my way. I always have. And, uh, uh, yeah, well, the negatives are that, uh, my my concerts and my my colleagues' concerts are cancelled all over the world, and uh, we are active performers, and uh, it's it's hard not to perform. Um, of course, it's it's difficult financially uh, if you just rely on on uh, performances. Luckily, I have a full time uh, professorship at at the University of Denver, Lamont School of Music, for the past four years, and which is why I live in Denver. And not to be confused with the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder. Okay. This is University of Denver in Denver, and um, and uh, so so I have I am fully employed there. But yes, I'm I'm not uh, all my concerts in Europe for the summer, which which I had a lot of are all cancelled. Some are postponed. Some are just cancelled because you can't really make up tours. You can't say I'll oh, well, we'll do the tour next year. Yeah, and. Um, and um, you know, a lot of musicians in, are in the same in the same uh, pot. Uh, um, as a freelance musician, you are completely on the drive because everything is dried up. If you don't have any any resources saved up, or any any teaching or anything that you're doing aside, it's it's truly a scary time. Um, for me, however, uh, since I'm teaching at university, I have a full studio of nine bassoon students here. And uh, we are fully integrated online. It's it's going very well. Um, you know, some students, of course, have hard time have hard time um, um, getting used to this online version. And uh, you just have to keep in mind that you have to get outside. You have to you have to be able to exercise. You have to be able to walk. You have to be able to jog. You can't just be cooped up inside because you'll go completely insane. You'll go insane literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, something, something is going to crack. Um, and and uh, so I talk a lot with my students uh, about uh, about their well-being. I encourage them to listen to music outside of their own. But we usually would do our usual curriculum, you know, bassoon bassoon music listen to uh, symphonies, listen to composers that you've always liked. Well, do things that you've never, you've never had time to do. Because frankly, we have more time now uh, than we usually would have. Uh, and uh, I have them practicing things that they, you know, working more on fundamentals. I myself work more on fundamentals and I, I find myself, you know, I'm one of these guys who's seen, done this, seen that, you know, or which way it goes. And, um, and, um, but I'm always, I'm an internal learner. And, uh, so I, tr I, I try to drive this point home with, with all my students too, or young bassoonists or just colleagues. Look, it's, it's, it's a special time that is not going to last forever. It's difficult. We'll get over it. It's going to take time, but use this time to your advantage rather than lament over it. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you have to eat rice and beans, eat rice and beans, but, but do what you, what is your, what is, what is your work and what you made money with before find ways to work it to your advantage, practice more, find, just put a, put a positive spin on it. Yeah. Sun will always shine. Yeah. It just, uh, you know, there could be clouds for a while, but it'll, it'll come out. And my family, same way, you know, everybody, all my three kids, and my wife is working full time at home, and uh, we are quite happily. It's 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 good family time. We've heard it before that this is, it's it's uh, good to connect with family, and we've always been a tight family. But I I basically um, live by 
you know, being closely connected and also with my students. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a family environment and I'm kind of, I guess I kind of like to, like to make sure everybody's okay. Yeah. Just the way I am. Yeah, well, you know, um, for those, uh, you know, uh, I told a couple of my friends that I'm gonna have you on and uh, one of the bassoon players, I was like, oh, you know Martin? He's like, well, I don't know him personally, but there's no bassoon player in the world that doesn't know Martin. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> everyone, knows, but- You're the bad thing. <laughs> yeah, well, well, of course, good thing with all the stuff that you've done. But uh, one thing that comes to mind is bassoon and, you know, getting into bassoon because that's not, an, that's not like a flute, that's not a violin, you know, where, you know, you go to school and people are like, well, you know, what instrument do you want? You pick a flute or a violin or a piano. Um, how did you come to even wanting to play the bassoon or were you kind of told to play the bassoon? Yeah, I didn't really want to play the bassoon. I had no idea. I, I just comple I completely, um, it was completely sidelined. I wasn't even thinking about it. I didn't even notice it. I started the piano when I was six in Estonia and at the Nelma Music School in Tallinn. And, uh, or that was like a kind of half-assed accent, uh, Tallinn, like we say in Estonia. Um, and talking to Armenian yeah. um, and and uh, then uh, my mom is a piano teacher although I didn't study with her then I continued on clarinet when I was 12 for three years and then I proceeded at 15 to go to a music high school uh, for it was basically it still exists now it's school for the school for the beautiful arts you know uh, ba uh, music ballet such Wonderful environment. Uh, everybody was a musician uh, at the time. It was just music, and uh, and I wanted to join in the high school. It's twelve years, a total school, but I was going to join in the high school with the clarinet. And uh, then this uh, wonderful uh, tuba player, who was a professor at the conservatory, and our family friend, who was a, uh, a tuba player for the Estonian um, Estonian National Symphony. Um, comes to me and my mom and just uh, spills the this you know this baggage on us oh martin you're you're tall why play the clarinet you know there's so many clarinet players and look there's a nice bassoon ascend, ascend, ascending right there this is a bassoon professor and oh, i already feel cornered in because this this uh, shorter man very humble standing you know three three meters from me kind of doodling his thumbs yeah, he was really, he was a thumb doodler uh, or dwindler, you know, and, and, um, and uh, so I know that he's hearing the conversation that uh, Estonia needs bassoons, that there are so many clarinet players that just, uh, you should try the bassoon, you're tall, and, and I mean, how tall you are has nothing, has no consequence whatsoever. There are very many shorter, very good bassoonists and successful bassoonists out there. And, and uh, but yeah, you would have a job in Estonia in four years at the, at the National Symphony. Well, I thought that was a good initiative. So I thought, yeah, well, why not? I didn't want to hurt his feelings, uh, the, the professor standing next to me. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll try both. And so uh, I went, in, this was in, in May. So I went that day, I took a bassoon with me and I had, I had a successful clarinet edition. I said, well, if you want to study both, go ahead. You know, it's going to be difficult because the clarinet teacher was very demanding. Estonia is very, very good clarinet school. And, and, uh, Joe, home I went with two cases. And uh, five months later, I didn't play the clarinet anymore. Wow. Mm -hmm. I love the bassoon. Well, yeah. you know, the amazing thing about Estonia is that it's probably a population of like 2 million people, right? Or maybe even less. Oh, you're, you're way overshooting. It's about a million. <laughs> <laughs> but we are stubborn. Man, we are stubborn. We've been around for uh, as long as Armenians have been around. Yeah, and, and uh, the amazing thing about Estonians is that so many talented people, I mean, not just classical music, but you're, you're also a tennis fan. Maybe we'll get uh, at some point get into some tennis too, but just... Uh, just how how is there so much talent in Estonia? That's all. That's impressive. I I think there is a uh, well. First of all, I thank you for, for on behalf of our nation. <laughs> uh, but um, you know what? I think what Estonians have uh, we have perseverance, and and we've been always. I mean, we are peasant people since uh, 
unlike uh, you know unlike the Scandinavians, we are we truly belong together with the Scandinavians with culture and all that. I mean, we're very close with Finns language, um, but uh, culturally uh, we are quite Scandinavian because we always were governed by by either Sweden or Denmark, never by Norway. Uh, so we are quite tight with Norway. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we are tight with all Scandinavian countries, and especially uh, Finland, which is not part of Scandinavia. Um, but um, we had to survive, and and uh, and uh, you know, it's it's continued to this day. Uh, just you know, just like we have to hold our language, um, Estonian, and. Uh, and I think they're talented people everywhere, but with the exception of the Estonian, Estonians are huge singers. They have our song festival and we sing all the time. And you know what happens when you sing is, uh, you know, you, you usually don't just, when you sing, you really let your soul get out there. Yeah. And I think uh, that opens up a drawer uh in in human where where they think more yeah. perhaps they'll become a musician or you know they they've grown up with this uh since early age and uh so i think that's why there are a lot of and we also have very very uh, that music school that we had we've talked about that uh, that i entered uh, there are a couple of those uh that are very good at at setting up foundations and uh and we have lots of opportunity in Estonia for for kids to perform, mm -hmm. and uh, they 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 get solfege, solfege and ear training from age six seven mm -hmm. in music schools. So, it uh, it basically sets up the foundation very well. Yeah. But then you know, if you look at if you look at uh, you know composers, yes, Arvo Pärt and Erkki Sventyr and and uh, Ulo Krikul and Tunnu Kurvits, who is uh, making huge, Tunnu is making huge waves all over. Yeah. And Erkis Ventur is now composing residence for Tonhalle Orchestra in Zurich. Um, and uh, Arvo Pärt, of course, everybody knows Arvo Pärt. Um, but they know Tamberg. I mean, there's so many. Lepo Zumara, who died a few years ago, he would have been right there in the same, uh, same, same batch. But, but, you know, conductors. You got the Yermi yeah. family and the Tali and you know just Risto Joost and um, uh, and Mihail Gertz. I mean, there there there's so many and so so many great female conductors coming up. Yeah, so you know I could go on and on. Yeah, into tennis players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I I know you're I I I've. I've realized or noticed with slight things, you're not overwhelming with um, the Estonian uh, passion that you have, but, but I could tell that you're very passionate about Estonia. So I, I, I appreciate hearing about it. Well, uh, actually mixing this up with um, uh, not, not, nothing so, so, so musical, but sort of musical uh, is uh, your, your phone or your computer. What, what are the last couple of tracks or last couple of pieces that you've been listening to, even if they're not classical music? Mm. Um, actually, the last, the very last thing I listened to was, uh, literally the very last thing was, uh, Leonor Cohen's Hallelujah. Hmm. Um, um, just because, I because I wanted to, um, but I, um, uh, I love Led Zeppelin. Hmm. Um, my son listens to, you know, I listen to a lot of music my son listens to, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's 17. My, my older son, our older son, I have. 12, 15, and 17 kids, daughter in the middle. Um, I listen to all kinds of music. Uh, uh, what was the last classical track? I don't know. I, I, I know it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen to myself much, uh, hardly, uh, hardly at all. Uh, but um, one should, however, yeah, just to keep, keep track. Yeah. Um, so I don't say never, but I love listening to all kinds of music. I, I don't have favorites and, uh, and, uh, just, I, I love good rock. Yeah. Um, uh, I love jazz, you know, give me anything miles. I, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. And, and speaking of jazz, uh, when, when I think of bassoon, I don't really think of jazz, but, but you've done some, some, uh, amazing collaborations with jazz artists. Uh, if, 
I don't want, if you don't have to say names or you can, but just some of your collaborations and how did your passion for jazz even come about and say, you know, in saying, you know, not many people do jazz bassoon, but I'm just going to do it. Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't, um, I've collaborated with great jazz composers um, and jazz legends. I mean, John Paditucci, I'm lucky for him to have written a, a fantastic uh, piece from me, 12 minute work that I premiered with him, uh, him on a bass and people that don't know, John Paditucci played all with Chick Corea and he's in, in uh, Wayne Shorter's quartet now and uh, is one of the bass players of our, of our time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I premiered it in New York for string quartet bassoon and bass. And um, he wrote it for me about 2003. Then I've, I've had a, an incredible opportunity to play with, with uh, Gary Mulligan, went back at Yale. I was in a group, chosen to be in a group that played a concert with him and then worked for years with Absolute Ensemble mm -hmm. Joe Zavino. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, to hang out with Joe Zavino on tours and, you know, talk to him and, and just, uh, I was late, I was seven, eight months late going to his house, inviting me over to his house to, uh, to, then after two years of working with him, he wanted to give me a couple ballads to play. And I thought, well, you know, we have a tour coming up and it may, we had, our daughter was just born and it was incredibly busy time. My dad passed and, uh, passed away and, and, uh, we're talking about 15 years ago so um and uh i ended up uh pushing it to september where we're gonna go on tour and then he's gonna give me those two pieces there this is joe's ominal weather report i mean yeah. david miles he he died week before the tour and then never got the pieces so i let i've i've let some chances go too but you know um such is life and I, i'm not a jazz bassoonist i i love jazz there, are, if I said I'm a jazz bassoonist, I would really uh, just, uh, I should be ashamed because uh, there are people like Paul Hansen, um, Alessandro Silverio, and in, in, uh, in Michael Rabinovitz. I mean, these are real jazz bassoonists. Yeah. And, and, uh, and uh, Arseny Spachkov, uh, Spachkov, you know, coming up and he lives in, he's a young player uh, in, in Switzerland. Uh, great kid. Um, and, and uh, you know, they, they really play. I dabble. I get around. I fool some people. I just love jazz and, and I improvise, yes. But uh, to really be jazz bassoonist, you, you, uh, you have to dig much deeper than I have. Yeah. I'm a classical player. Well, um, have, uh, you didn't mention after graduating in Estonia, did you end up playing in the orchestra there? Uh, no. <laughs> I ended up playing with the orchestra, fortunately, and I've, I'm, I've recorded with them. Estonian National Symphony Orchestra, they are fabulous. Uh, uh, last concerts were with Neme Arvi, you know, my, my dream to, as I was growing up, to play with Neme Arvi in his orchestra, but I ended up playing a soloist with him. Um, and, uh, but I played for years with, um, with uh, Estonian Festival Orchestra. Uh, until just a few years ago when I had to stop because of touring. Yeah. Uh, that it's when they really hit it big. Pavo Arvi is the initiator and the star and music director of it. And he is without the doubt the, bi the biggest uh, condu Estonian conductor of all times. And of course, he always puts his dad in the first place who started everything. And yeah. Emmett is still the legend. Yeah. Um, but Pavo is huge now. And, uh, and uh, his, uh, his brother, Christian, Yarvi, who conducts all over the place, whom I'm very close friends with. Um, so I played in Christian's group Absolute Ensemble. I played the solos with his or orchestras. I've, you know, the Estonian National Symphony. No, I never played. I never played there. I, they're a great, great group. Yeah. I ended up playing in uh, New York orchestras in all these, uh, you know, Orpheus and St. Luke's and and Broadway shows when I went to New York after, after graduating from Yale. I was in California first. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But um, I had I love playing in the orchestra. So even though I'm a I'm you know referred to as a solo artist, I have a vast knowledge of playing in the orchestra for about twenty years. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know recording movie scores in Seattle, numerous movie scores, uh, and 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 I mean video games and. Yeah. 
just you you name it yeah. um yeah so it's all part of it and chamber music and uh, but uh, you know what i've left the orchestra that you brought it up i left uh, estonian i mean the estonian festival orchestra because of the touring because i can't take off two or three weeks and i really miss it i miss playing in the orchestra i wouldn't want to do it full time but it's it's part of me that that really um a big part of me is missing by not being able to play in the orchestra. It's just the camaraderie, just to to soak in all the sounds around you and and to blend and all this. So uh, in time, I'll I'll get back to it. I'm only I'm only in my late forties. <laughs> well, I was gonna say you've you've played with uh, so many orchestras as a soloist, both standard repertoire, but also you've done a lot of premieres. Uh, what is what is one concerto maybe that you you can't wait to play again that you, maybe you've done it once or maybe if you've done it a hundred times you you really want to go back to it and do it again um you know what i i've played mozart concerto many times and i can't wait to play it again it's it's one of these concertos that you always uh, you, you can never play the same way you should never play the same way it's it's uh uh, you always have to bow, you know, it's Mozart. You can't, you can't play it like, uh, like some, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to play it in style. It, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't just do your own thing You leave your own mark. And, and, and this is Kuskman. This is Kuskman's way. I uh, know I, I like to play Mozart, keep it Mozart, but yes, you know, my own, it's, I love playing Mozart. Um, in a way, of course, you make your own mark, but it's about Mozart. It's not about you. Um, I love to play. I've played Theophanides, Chris Theophanides Concerto, uh, most of all, I think 40 or 50 times wow. uh, since since he wrote it for me in 97. Uh, I premiered with Absolute Ensemble and Christian Yarvi, and and uh, we went to school together with with uh, Chris. Um, oh, and he's now the professor at Yale. Um, and... Um, and um, well, I love playing. Uh, I have about 13 concertos and I have three other premieres, no four, coming up in the next two, three years. Um, always looking into the future and, uh, and you know, planning ahead. Uh, but uh, every concerto is special and I have, I, I can't really say which ones I really want to play most uh, but I do look forward to what's coming next. Uh, like I'm recording the Erkis van Tur concerto, the, that he, uh, which is really a, a a cello concerto that he reworked. He completely rewrote the solo material for bassoon, amplified bassoon, and it works tremendously well. I've done it with uh, the uh, Middle German Radio Orchestra in Leipzig, uh, Christian Erbe, and we premiered it together in Sweden. And uh, then, of course, uh, Thunberg, Eino Thunberg Concerto, which I'm going to record with the Estonian National Symphony Orchestra. Thur is actually recorded as well with the Estonian National Symphony Orchestra. And uh, Misha Gertz, uh, Michael Gertz next year. Uh, so these are the concertos and Ulo Krikul. I mean, these are the concertos that, I'm, that are in my, in my peripheral view right, right, right now, and I really look forward to these. Uh, Kurvi, it's also I'm, re, um, I'm doing a new recording of that. Then the new concerto that is Paul Ragnar Palson from Iceland is writing for me. Yeah, it's I'm not uh, a uh, uh, you know one one pony artist or what it is. I look forward to I I find beauty and and and. Uh, vision in everything every new piece and i'm looking forward to everything and i teach i tell my students all the pieces that are written for me are are fantastic uh but even if you get a piece that you don't like or you don't understand um you see it's our problem to figure it out because if a composer releases it um let's go of it it has to be special. There has to be there has to be something in it. And if you say that that piece is piece of crap that you don't, then this is your problem, because this person he or she saw beauty in it, or they. And and uh, if you can't 
see the point. If you can't figure it out, it may not be a masterpiece, but there is definitely beauty and point there. And, and uh, that's, that's the beauty of being a, a musician or a just, you know, magician. Yeah. Work, working it out, figuring it out. Um, but you know what, actually, one piece that is really on my mind that I really want to perform is uh is um david chesky concerto it's it's i got my first grammy nomination with it um in 2007 and uh he's now set it for for um made a version for bassoon and string quartet the reason why i haven't been able to play with symphony orchestra is because uh it's, it's incredibly effective concerto based on on uh right of spring and David Chesky is a uh, in audio audio world, and he's he has a record company, and and he's a terrific composer and great jazz pianist. Well, uh, the the orchestra part is just too difficult for most orchestras to put together in a week. Yeah, yeah so that's the reason because usually we have two or three rehearsals. That's it, you know. And but this, you know, they need to practice two or three days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that part alone at home, orchestra part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, but I, I look forward to all of the pieces that are that are that are, that are written to, for me, and and there really isn't one that I really want to play more than others. Yeah, honestly, it's it's uh, every every single one of them is is equally exciting. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to go back to your current place and your current position. Why why Denver? Why Lamont? It's where the where you know what it's where the job opened up but i would not have i wouldn't have known i was teaching um, at manhattan school of music i was very excited about it. it's my alma mater uh, you know i started off at san jose state from estonia that went to san jose state i have a host family who i'm still very very close with in california um they were at the time living in morgan hill you know two years there then to yale three years with stephen maxim and then with frank morelli in in, in manhattan school for two years, and to have hired, to have uh, gotten to be hired back by Manhattan School of Music as a, as a as a teacher as a faculty, that was a big deal, and I taught there for years, but it wasn't a full time position until in 2016 I was actually offered practically a full time. It was a part time position, but on full time yearly salary at Manhattan School, and um, um, living in Washington State. We moved away from New York City because I really wanted to get away from the uh, heavy freelancing and just focus on my on my uh, solo career and raise a family and have more have more children. We had only one child when we moved from New York City. And my wife is an interior designer, architect, and and she stayed at home for 16 years with kids. And so we needed a more quiet place. And it was close to her home, which is in Vancouver. She was born in, in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, and so we lived there for 16 years, and I basically was traveling to New York and everywhere else from Vancouver Airport, sometimes from Seattle. But uh, I was in Japan uh, in, in 2015, International Double Read Society Conference, and playing a concerto there. And uh, and I get this message from Ransom Wilson, who was a flute professor at Yale. And uh, he's played a, he's played like a, <laughs> like, uh, uh, like a godfather of finding things for Martin to do um, inadvertently. <laughs> uh, I just said, uh, I get a text from him, but Martin, by the way, there is a, there's a, there's an opening. We haven't talked for years. And this text come from, comes from Ransom Martin. There's an opening in Denver, University of Denver. You probably haven't heard, but it's a nice music school. And uh, Denver is a great place. And uh, yes, it's a music school of 300 students. It's perfect size. And, and uh, you should apply if you want to. It's a full-time position. So I applied. And I had just negotiated a yearly salary with Manhattan School. And um, so, you know, I, I ended up coming on top. Uh, I was what they were looking for in Denver that year, and and so I couldn't keep the Manhattan School of Music job because it was a conflict of interest, interest with uh, with University of Denver. 
So I had to leave Manhattan school. And that's how I ended up in Denver. And the only thing I miss here is, what do you think? Uh, I don't even know. Is it the food, the diversity of the yeah, food? water. Oh, uh, water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I have water, but this is eat the glass Finland. Uh, but uh, now I re I have always grown up next to water, and in in Washington we lived lived three hundred three hundred yards from water, three hundred meters, you know, and uh, it was just beautiful. So I really miss water, but everything else I love it here. Um, so, uh, so uh, we all have inspirational figures in our uh, in our lives, whether they're musicians or not. Some some of the most important influ influential people in your life, and inspirational influential people in your life. Um, my grandma. Uh, she she uh, she 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 didn't uh, she didn't uh, my grandma. My mom's mom. She she didn't, uh, you know, what, what's that word? Uh, well, she was always very inspirational. She she uh, she always encouraged me to do what I what I was doing, music and you know, compliments and all this. Never over complimenting, you know, but uh, still grounded. Um, then, I mean, of course, my parents, my mom, my dad, but. But uh, I had a, uh, I sang in choir since I was uh, age nine. I went to, uh, he was a very tall man, Venno Laul. Then he became uh, the, the dean of rector of, of the, the music conservatory in, uh, in Estonia, in Tallinn. And um, he, he was, you know, almost seven feet, very tall. And here's me, nine years old, going to him at the school presentation concert where Estonian Estonian Philharmonic Voice Choir came to sing. And I really wanted to be part of it. So I, w I went to this very tall man. I remember asking a little bit, you know, I was nervous, of course, that that comrade, you know, you had to you had to refer to people. You, there was no Mr. or, or Herr. Uh, it was comrade, comrade Laud. <laughs> this is Soviet times. That I would like to join this choir. So... He told me to come in and you know sing for him and uh, and uh, at that before the rehearsal and so I became member of the Estonian Philharmonic Voice Choir uh, from age nine to six age nine to to nineteen. There were two years that I you know was break, I broke the voice and then I went back to young men chorus, and that was extremely instrumental in my in my uh, upbringing. Just the way I the way I open up phrases and the way I play. Because I grew, I really knew how to how to use the voice, and so he was very instrumental. And of course, uh, then my first bassoon teacher, who always had me play. Me the, I, I thought, you know, why doesn't he give me technical things to play? It was always he started with melodies. It was all just to to learn to sing on the bassoon, just beautiful melodies by Bach, airs, and things like this. And and uh, then. Uh, uh, I started with uh, Rufus Olivier, who was uh, was uh, who is principal bassoonist of the of the San Francisco Opera and Ballet. He was extremely, extremely influential of me um, going on to to Yale, and uh, you know, just uh, we had fantastic lessons. Um, I was often on his personal scholarship. I mean, I didn't have much money, and uh, he just. He just gave me lessons for free very often. Wonderful man. We're still very close. And then, then uh, uh, my mentors, uh, Stephen Maxim and uh, and uh, Frank Morelli. Frank Morelli, is Stephen Maxim student. And Stephen Maxim saw so many of the top players in the world, uh, or top orchestra players, not only in America but also in Europe. And you know, these are these are these are my. Uh, these are my mentors, you know. I, I look up to them. But then, I mean, you have mentors all over. Listening to Heinz Holliger or, or, or uh, Martha Argerich or or Klaus Tunemann or Doug Jensen or just uh, even my own. I, I find I found inspiration. Even you know, I find inspiration in my students. I mean, there's it's there's inspiration everywhere. My colleagues. Mm -hmm. it's just you got to remain open. But if you talk about mentors, you know, these are they are on the special special yeah. shelf yes
Yeah. Well, a life-changing moment, whether it's a musical or a non-musical moment that really just shaped who you are now. New York. It was my years in New York uh, where, where I, I just got to taste every, every different kind of musical, musical genre. And that's where I, that's, that's, this is where I really decided that this is, you know, I got so much experience there as a, as a player, um, more than most can have in their, in, you know, as far as variety, more than most can have in their whole career. And, and it's, uh, I consider myself very lucky. And uh, yeah, the, the, my, new, my New York years, but uh, you know, life changing, having kids, <laughs> having kids, that, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, I've, I've had to do many things differently ever yeah. since then. You can't tour like you toured before. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, you've had a great career, uh, you know, playing all over the world and, and, you know, a lot of young musicians struggle, especially early on in their careers. What advice would you give them? What encouragement would you give them? Um, whether they're bassoonists or just musicians in general, in general, uh, any musician or well, any artist or any, no, anybody, it can be, uh, somebody studying, studying business. I mean, it's, uh, what I do is business. Um, and, and, uh, I am the business and, and, um, you just really have to know that this is what you want to do because the going will get rough yeah. at times. And uh, it it goes with it goes with anything, any any career, any given career. Most musicians they end up doing their life. Uh, they they study from early on, so they keep doing it. But they they get bitter. Many get bitter. Many people in New York got uh, got bitter. That's why I left because I I hated being in a in a amongst people who just you know excuse me bitch and moan about their about their life. Yeah. Why do you do it? There are so many younger players who would love to be in your, in your position, but, but they have nothing else to do. They're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. um, they stop practicing. They just, they just go from, yeah. So you should never stop practicing and, and never stop pushing, uh, pushing boundaries. I love pushing boundaries. I live for pushing boundaries and make sure that your roots are strong. Always practice found, uh, foundation, foundational matters. Uh, the foundation is everything. I love to build too. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually a good carpenter. Um, just so if your if your bottom bottom is is shaky or holes, it's the the top. It's gonna fall down sooner or later. And uh, granted, so but most of it has to do with passion. Make sure you're passionate about it, and make sure you do it with passion. And don't just think that you're doing it with passion. Really believe in it and and be uh, very self-critical, but not, not deprivating. Um, because uh, there is, there is a uh, like what you're doing. You have to learn to like your playing. You have to be critical. You have to be able to fix things, uh, uh, but you still have to like your own sound. And you know, it's otherwise you're in the wrong, you're going the wrong route. Yeah. Um, you have to be able to fix things, but, but yeah, be self-critical, but not self-deprivating, you know, just give yourself space. Um, but yeah, um, a lot of musicians go into it because they've studied it for a long time yeah. and they're afraid to change. Yeah. But uh, there is nothing wrong with changing your career when you're 24, 25, you learn something really well. Well, go change, go, go do something else. It only takes two years to study something else and be happy because everybody's good in something. Everybody's good in something. A musician might be really great in, uh, as a lawyer, you know, or yeah. it's a lot it's more boring, but, but that's what I think, but maybe that's not what they think. They, yeah. they might find that this is exactly what they need to do and it is super exciting. Yeah. Um, but uh, actually, I think I would have made a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you said something about pushing boundaries. And when I think of pushing boundaries, it's also scary, you know, because music, musical world could be so judgmental. You know, you do something that's a little bit out of the ordinary and there are so many people here to judge if no one else has done that before. But then, of course, there are many, many supportive people, but it can be scary to push boundaries. Oh, you're telling me. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, 
you're right on the money because uh, here, I mean, my, my, my competition uh, is not another bassoonist. My competition is a pianist, a uh, violinist, uh, not even a wind player really, because us wind players, you know, clarinet players are more known as, as, as uh, soloists, but bassoonists rarely. But the more people play bassoon uh, out there are soloists. So that's why I, I, I'm very openly calling out, the, look, play more. Everybody should play more, uh, expose themselves more as a bassoon soloist, because it, it, then more people hear you. And presenters are less scared in, in presenting something that people don't know. Yeah. So people, if people know it, people like to listen to what they've heard before. Or oh, this is a nice song. We listen to it, you know, over and over ten times, and they, it's their favorite song for the past twenty years. But uh, and and uh, people like repetition, and and but if it, there's something new, it's oh, wh what was that? You know, there is all this vibration that comes as a new thing. No, we want to, oh, this is it's bassoon. Yes, of course, you know, yeah, we should have a bassoon, just like we have violins. We have, uh, we have 400 violin soloists this, this year, you know. <laughs> why, why should we have only one bassoonist? Yeah. Of course, we're talking about 12 violin soloists, but, uh, but bassoonist comes every three years. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Of course, you have to play the way that you're, conv that you're convincing, you know, you can't just, you can't just go and, Try. I mean, but there, there. I'm. I'm not the lonely one here. I'm. Yes. I've. I've. Uh, I have a lot of commissions, but there are several bassoonists who, who are who are terrific soloists all over the world. Well, last question. Uh, I want to hear something that your fans, your followers, don't know about you, but you're willing to share with us. Uh, <laughs> um. But they probably don't know that I love cooking. Mm. Um, I am, um, I'm, uh, I'm an athlete. I like, I love to, I love, I love to keep, keep fit. I'm not a gym buff, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty decent cross country skier, and I love playing tennis, and uh, I'm a really devoted family man. I've been married for 23 years, very, very happily, and. Um, and uh, uh, I'm uh, quite grounded. And if I, if I start working with someone, I, I keep that relationship for, for a long time. Like I've, you know, I play with Moosman Bassoon, German bassoon maker. Um, and uh, we develop the bassoon together. And, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm pretty steadfast when it comes to uh, sticking sticking with with uh, with people that are that are that i believe in yeah well you mentioned bassoon i i have to ask i know i said last question but bassoons are expensive yes uh but, but pianos are also expensive <laughs> <laughs> uh bassoons are expensive yes and that's that is one reason why why so uh well they kind of you know they they look a bit funny too yeah. You know, this Estonian kid, I was sent this video at, uh, that uh, I like clarinet and I like tuba, but, but bassoon, I don't like the bassoon. It's just funny looking. It's got this, it's got this string coming out. <laughs> you call it string coming out of the, this funny string coming out. Yeah. So, yeah, because the, the cheapest bassoon you can buy is what, three, four thousand dollars. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it goes up to, you know, my bassoon is up for 30 grand and uh but yeah it goes and it really is the worth probably as much you know as you know fifty sixty thousand dollars like heckle bassoons which are the 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 uh you know the the, the uh, i used to play heckle um but it, this is the most famous brand uh german bassoon yeah they they are expensive but now a lot of bassoons have caught up and are playing in the in the same in the same the same quality instruments as heckle like mine i just wanted to play something different mm. you know uh that is not heckle so i sold my heckle um and and uh yeah it's it's they're expensive 
and that's why you need to be wise that you're you really it's 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 very it's a very good instrument to play if you want to find a job yeah if you do it well you will get a job you know and uh you just have to do it very well yeah um yeah so so uh but you know you it's it's a great instrument to play because it's got such a big range and you can play nice melodies and and you can always it's challenging yeah it always gives you challenge it always gives you challenge yeah and for those who are, are interested or want to promote the bassoon more they just have to look up some pictures of you you make it look exciting with the bassoon and the way you perform and the excitement and energy it it, it, it looks exciting and um so uh it'll, it'll it'll get there i i do hope that uh some of the bassoon and some other instruments get more playing time with uh with the the major orchestras around the world as much as you know some of the big um instruments like the violin cello piano but thank you so much martin Does, is there anything else you want to add before we end today no we should work together you work <laughs> we I've worked with youth orchestras. We should do something together. Yeah. There's always ways to to uh, to uh, to uh, give something new to youth because that's where everything is. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Martin. Have a beautiful day, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Take care.